You did, yeah. Oh, I've got my phone. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. Good afternoon, yeah. God, it's nearly there. Champagne soon. Don't worry, it'll be okay. All right, what are we going to do today? We're going to go through this, which you've seen, which is why you're here. So I'm going to start off with a question. Oh, I'm not. I'm going to go back. What's the primary aim of an organization? Not a trick question. What is the primary aim of an organization? Profit? Sorry? Produce? For what reason? Delivery service for what reason? To fulfill its what? Its promise. Its purpose. Well, and its purpose is to do what? What is the primary aim of an organization? Make money. Now, you might say, oh, well, hang on a second. Uh, I work in the charity sector, and I would say, well, the primary aim of your organization is to maximize the money that you can give to other people, to maximize the amount of money you can get in, maximize the use of it through your business. But it's all about maximization. Would you tend to agree with that? Okay, I just want to check, because that's what we're sort of sticking to over the next 20 minutes or so. Lots and lots of people talk about strategy. Good old Winston Churchill said, that's fine, but every once in a while, take a look at the results. And results and results and results is what we're going to be talking about today, not just with learning, but with a whole bunch of other stuff. Okie dokie. Here are some um, logos of organizations you may well recognize. Question is, some people have said there are two critical roles within these organizations, and if those roles get it badly wrong, the organization could fail. What do you think those two roles are? No. No. Sorry? No. 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 <laughs> I do know other words. Okay. I'll give you one. One is the baggage handler. Baggage handlers say, no. Doesn't matter how good your maintenance is, how good your strategy is, how good your marketing is, your plane doesn't go. Is that fair to say? Same to do with pilot, but the thing is, there's, you know, this is what somebody else has said, and this is what I'm using. So, baggage handlers is one. The other one, if they get it wrong, it will absolutely bleed money. What do you think the role is? No. I tell you, it's the fuel buyer. The person who buys the fuel. You look at how an airline works, you look at the marginal cost, you look at the cost of fuel in the overall piece, and it's enormous. You get that wrong, and every time you start the engine, you're losing money. Make sense? Okay, let's have a look at another one. Coca-Cola. Take two things away from Coca-Cola, and it's not Coca-Cola anymore. What do you think those two things might be? Sugar. Okay. <laughs> that would be Coke light, wouldn't it? Yeah. Sorry? Advertising, sort of. Brand, absolutely right. Coca-Cola, almost year after year after year, is considered to be one of the world's biggest brands. How many people here have heard EBITDA? The term EBITDA. Oh boy, you're going to have fun. Okay. Anybody know what the A stands for in EBITDA? Amortization. And what is amortization? <laughs> it's basically the depreciation of intangible assets. The brand is an intangible asset. You cannot go and pick it up and do stuff with it. It's what people think it's worth. Coca-Cola, depending on, and I've got a number of figures here, depending on the figures I've looked at, it's anywhere between about 50 and 60 billion US in brand value. If its brand gets damaged, it ain't Coca-Cola anymore. What do you think the other thing is that makes Coca-Cola Coca-Cola? The recipe, absolutely right. Because they say we have a secret recipe, and that's why we're Coca-Cola. Because if we didn't have a secret recipe, we'd be sugared water. Okay. So my question really then, oh, hang on, so I've got one more, Microsoft. 90,000 employees. Bill Gates said there are a number of employees in Microsoft who, if they left, the company would fail. What do you think that number is? Remember, there's 90,000 global employees. The correct answer. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. No, the trick is, you wait a few minutes, then you come over with the other. No, you're absolutely right. Bill Gates said there's 20 key people in Microsoft. <laughs> there are 20 key people in Microsoft. Those people go. It ain't Microsoft anymore. Okay? That's, that's the fact. So the reason I'm leading you in here 
is to say to you just really, how well do you know your organization? People say, oh, I know what my organization does. You go, okay, well, what does it do? How does it do that? What makes it successful? What's critical to its success? If it lost something, what would happen? People say, well, I don't know. So the thing here is, you know, what is actually driving performance within your organization? Now, in terms of performance, what a lot of people do, and for my sins, um, I'm a national judge for the Institute of IT Training Awards, and each year people come along and they, they pitch their sort of stuff, and they say, this is how we should tell we did. We're in a training L&D community. What do you think a lot of people use as, as the metric for turning around and saying, hey, this is, this is how we know we're good? What do you think they use? Yeah, but what sort of KPIs? Remember, they're in training. So what sort of things might you they talk about? Sorry? Happy sheep. Yeah, what else do you think they might talk about? Numbers, yeah. Last year, we trained 400 people in underwater knitting, and the year before, we trained 300 people, so we're now better. How does that sound to you? Sound about right? Yeah. So here, I'm just going to talk to you a little bit about metrics, metrics that matter. And this is my classification, and I've got some here that are training-related. What I'm saying is that some of these are input metrics. How many bums on seats, what was the cost of a course, and various other things. Whether you've had 100 people, 100,000 people, and I'll give an example later on. It sort of doesn't matter because there's a whole load of other stuff you've got to take into account. And actually, if you're judging yourself on that, and you're standing up in front of your business talking about that, and you wonder why your business is looking at you in a strange way, it's because they don't get that. So then people say, oh, I'll tell you what we'll do. We'll talk about how many joining instructions and what percentage of joining instructions we sent out and the fact that people like to train us. I can guarantee to you, and this means that somebody's going to go the opposite way, I can almost guarantee to you that in all the sessions you've been in, you will not have written down, I thought the trainer was crap. Just out of interest, of the sessions you've been to today, hands up if you've written down, I thought the person presenting was crap. There you go. One or two. Okay. Almost proves the rule. But again, it's a process metric. Then people say, well, somebody, or oh, they learned something. Well, of course you learned something. It's training. The thing is, what are you going to do with what you've learned? So people say, oh, when they came in, they didn't know about blah, and now they know lots about it. But at the other end is the output metric, is what I've called the output metric. Our sales going up, our profits going up, things like that. Now, the reason I've gone through that is to say that as L&D and training people, what quite often happens is people start here, and they say how many courses we're doing, how many bums on seats we've got. And actually, they need to be going out here. They need to be saying, what's going to make a difference in our business? And if somebody says, we need to sell more, okay, well, let's work out how we can get you selling a lot more stuff. Because here's the thing that I read the other day. Anybody heard of a sales process called spin? Okay, fact. People who go on a spin course sell 17% more stuff. Do you think that's a pretty good measure? I think that's excellent. You know, people who go on that course sell 17% more stuff. That's at the output end. It doesn't matter how many people go through it, it's at the output end. So people need to start at the output end. But let's just walk through something. This, some of you will know. Credit cards. This happened a few years ago. More people coming in, more customers. Do you think that's a good thing or a bad thing for a company, generally speaking? That's a good thing, absolutely right. Does anybody know the metric? You get a new customer, how much more does it cost you to get that new customer than to keep a customer? Normally about five times more to get a new customer than it does to keep, to keep an existing customer. But okay, you need new customers, that's part of your business. That's all coming in. So new customers, that's a high cost, but maybe that's driving a business. Problem with this credit card is you had, or credit card system, you had people leaving, didn't you? And as they were leaving and all deals were being done and there was churn, the end result was that whilst people were saying, ah, oh, well, we've got X amount of new customers into our credit card, they were actually losing money because of the churn that was going on. The amount of money they were spending to feed the system was unbelievable. And that's why I say about the metrics. Don't just look at one, look at the whole thing. Say, what is it that's driving our business? So in people now in credit cards, when they're targeting customers, what do they look for now? profitable ones, i.e. the ones that they believe are right for their business model. It might be the, the people who spend a lot. It might be people that have a, a high outstanding balance. Whatever the case may be, it's people who suit their business model. And once you know that, 
You can then go after the business, you can train, you can educate to make sure that your salespeople are selling in the appropriate way. You've got all the right checks and balances in place to get those people. Does that make sense? Rather than coming at it from, from the other end. Okay. The thing with metrics is all of these things that I've got here. And I'm going to give you an example that I use a lot with clients. If I said, right, we are in the holiday business, and one of the things we're going to publish in our brochure for all the places, all our sort of destinations, is the number of blue sky days a fortnight. What's wrong with that metric? What's wrong with that measure? Blue sky days a fortnight. Can't guarantee what? You can't guarantee, but you, could you measure it? Yeah, how would I measure it? Blue sky days a fortnight, how would I measure it? Okay. Okay, but just think about it. What is blue? What, wh when is it not blue? When is it a gray sky day and not a blue sky day? I once said this to Americans, and they said, what's a fortnight? <laughs> True, they don't use the term. So wh what is a blue sky day? What time of day do I measure it? Because if I measure it at night, I'm going to go, no, it's dark again. <laughs> well, you never said when to measure it. What do you measure it against in terms of blue? Where do you stand? Right, so the reason I mention that is because some people, when they go after working out all this stuff, have the most complicated metrics you can imagine that are almost impossible to measure, impossible to update, and all the rest of it. You need simple, simple stuff. And that's why when you sit down with your business people and go, what is it that drives this business? They will be able to tell you, we need to sell more. Or we need to make sure that we cut our costs, or whatever the case may be. Does that make sense to people? Okay, good stuff. Right. 2006, which company was losing almost 900 million litres of water a day. Thames water, gone down in history, isn't it? So if Thames water was losing 900 million litres of water a day, <coughs> why don't they do something about it? The cost of what? Absolutely. The cost of repair. And the reason I mention this is because, again, when you're looking at putting learning somewhere and you say, oh, look at that, bloody hell, that's a thing we could put learning against, one of the things is, what's the cost of actually turning around and getting that sorted out? And there was two problems. One was absolutely right, the cost of the main pipe. Does anybody know what the secondary problem was, which never really was big in the news? There was a secondary issue to, to that number. Anybody know what it was? 25% of that water was being lost in the customer pipeline. So take your house. If you've got a dripping tap or a wonky pipe or your outdoor tap drips, that was contributing to that. Thames Water couldn't do anything about that. So 25% of that problem, they could do nothing about. Yet it's their water coming out of the system. So again, it's about understanding the business and understanding what's, what's going on um, with it. Right, I'm going to flick this over, then I'll keep myself exactly where I want to be. So the question then is, where can you start to look at learning and how can you start to do it? So I want to give you, in a few minutes, a real-world example. So here's a real story. This was an organization I worked in many years ago. So this is an old story, but like a lot of old stories, it's a good one. So bear with me on this. I used to sit down with um, colleagues, and one of the things that we used to look at was, was turnover, so the number of people leaving a business. Does anybody here look at that within their business, for example? Do anything with it? Yeah, most people will have a little look at it. Okay. And sort of what we expected to see was this. And we, we used to call it the camel, because there used to be two quite distinct humps. And this is turnover by length of service. One was at about five years, uh, and one was about ten years. And we knew the reason for that, people getting married and moving away, or they're going to another job, or whatever the case may be. So we had pretty low turnover in the business, so that was, that was okay. We looked at it one day, and we had a shock, because that is actually what we saw. What do you think that said to us? Remember, this is turnover by length of service. The induction program's not working. Anybody else like to go with, hands in the air, please, the induction program's not working? Okay, other people are going, oh, I don't know, there's a tricky question there. So what else might not be working? Recruitment. 
absolutely right. And we knew we had an issue. And we turned around and we said, this is a four million quid issue. We worked this out very, very quickly. We said, it's a four million quid issue. Do you think it was worth trying to fix that? Yeah. And the answer is it was. The thing was, we knew how much it was going to cost us to fix it, and I'll re reveal how much that was, was in a moment. So what do you think we did to start fixing this problem? We said, hang on, this, this is affecting the business. The business needs good, high-quality people coming in. The business has put in a lot of effort to get Fred and Frida through the door, and then a number of them are promptly walking out again. So what do, you th what do you think of the things that we started to look at? What would you do if it was your problem? Qualification of the recruiter? Well, it was our own branch staff. So it was the people in the branch. It was the branch managers who, was doing the, who, who were you know, doing the interviewing and that sort of stuff. Exit interviews? Yeah, absolutely right. We needed to pick those up. What else did we need to do? Sorry? Maybe retention incentives? These people go, some of these people were going after a month. Sorry? A job specification? Yeah? Yeah, training programs for new people? What else do you think? Exit interviews, yeah? Were they right people? And why would we do exit interviews? What would we learn from exit interviews? Why they were leaving? Okay, why do you think so many people were coming through the door and then walking out again? Okay. What else do you think? Sorry, say again? More management skills, no? No? Most of them had got another job offer. This was financial services. Not being sexist, a lot of these people were young girls and young lads that were being recruited in. And we'd say, we'll pay you X, and they already have an interview with a big rival who would pay them X, plus maybe 500 pound or 1,000 pound more. Our offer got to them first. A month later, the other one got to them, and they went, bloody hell, that's another 1,000 pound. I'm off. Literally, this is what was going on. So once we knew that, what do you think we did? No. <laughs> no, wishful thinking, no. Sorry? No, what do you think we did? Sorry? No, well, yeah, but if it, whatever it was, you know, they, 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 they went. You know, you, you, you could hold them for a period of time, but, but that was it. What would you do? Knowing what the problem is, what would you do? Okay, and we knew that, and we knew that the, we knew that the competitors were paying some more money. No, 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 no. It's simple. This is simple. You ask them an interview. Hello, are you going anywhere else for a job? And they would go, Yes, I am. I'm thinking of going to so and so. And you go, Well, that's interesting. Thank you very much indeed. Make a note of that. None of this was complex. This was all simple stuff. Were we were we interviewing the right way? No, we weren't. Was every manager asking the same set of questions? No, they weren't. Did we have the same you know, measurements of people? No, we didn't. Did we bring them into the business in the right way? No, we didn't. Did we actually ask them all the questions for the reasons we were losing them? No, we didn't do any of that. And was the induction brilliant? No, it wasn't. But, you know, most of them were actually walking out the door before they got a decent induction in the first place. And it wasn't complex. It was just asking people these questions. The other thing that we had was, at that time, when we put out an offer letter, so imagine how much work's got to be done to get to the offer. They would put out the offer letter. Do you know how many percent, do you know what percentage of people rejected that offer letter? 20%. So 20% of all the people that we'd done all this work on went, no. Nah. What we can that, yeah, I know, but I don't want that. So we had all of these things to deal with, and we dealt with them because we understood the business. We understood what was driving it. We knew where to put the learning and where to put the changes. And what we had was we restructured the whole thing. So, for example, we did some really cute stuff. When we sent them their offer letter, we sent them a video welcoming them to the company. And we spoke to one girl. We then used to have entrance interviews. So we'd actually say to people, what do you think of the process? And one girl said, my nan said, if I don't come and work for you, I'm mad. And we said, your nan? Oh, yeah, the whole family's seen the video. Really? Yeah, my nan said that other big company might be offering you a bit more money, but they haven't sent you a video, have they? Absolutely made a difference. You think about it. This could be your first job. And from one person, you just get a letter going, dear miss, thank you, and there you go. And from somebody else, says, look, great to see you. This is fantastic. What do you want me to join our team? Here's a video all about us. Simple, simple stuff. It cost us 30 grand to fix a four million pound problem. 
Okay, so that was the fact of that. So, you know, really good stuff. I'm going to crack on now for another few minutes. Um, this was management today. So this is, this is not me, this is official clever people who said 10 ways to bigger budget. Because who wants a bigger budget? Yeah, everyone wants a bigger budget. And he said, number one, fix real problems. So, you know, people go, I think we, what we're going to have, we're going to have um, social networking for, um, you know, whatever we're going to do within our business. And you wonder why people give you blank faces. I'm not being awful, I'm, I'm being actually honest here. Because people don't see, they go, well, I haven't got a social networking problem. I'll just turn it off. I'll block it in the firewall. Say, ah, it's not a problem anymore. Okay, so fix real problems. We had a real problem. This is a problem. We're hemorrhaging people. It's costing us four million quid. Let's go fix it. Da -da. It's a way to get a bit, a, bit, a bit bigger budget. Linking what you're doing to your strategy, hardly surprising. And the other one is value for money. It doesn't matter what the others are. Most people never even get there. Most people never get past the first few. How many of you downstairs, out of interest, when you're walking around the exhibition, actually walk up to people selling or whatever it is and say to them, right, you tell me exactly what that's going to do for my business in value terms. You tell you what, that's the scariest thing you can ask. And I'm not being, I'm not being awful. Because people go, ah, well, it's really nice and it works on the web. Go, yeah, I know that. <laughs> but what's it going to do for my business? I, many years ago, I had a lot of work for an entrepreneur, and every morning you, you, you'd turn up at his office and he would look at you and he'd go, are you going to make me money today? <laughs> yeah, all right then. That was it. So you need to think about that. Okay, the other thing is this, and there's a great book on this called The Knowing Doing Gap. Um, and I'm going to talk about this very, very briefly because the time's moving on. In organizations, it is amazing when you talk to people and say, do you know what your problems are? And they go, yeah, I know what the problems are. This is buff, that's buff. That bit's wrong. Sales aren't very good. Product's useless. Da, 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 da. They know everything. And you go, oh, you know it all. They go, oh, yeah. Why don't you do something about it? Oh, well, that's, that's, a, bit, that's a bit different. And so there's a great book. It's a very old book. But now it's been written called Knowing Doing Gap. And it talks about this. And it says, you know what? The difference between companies that know and companies that do is the difference sometimes between failure, going out of business, and world class. Jack Welch, um, the ex-CEO of uh, GE is quoted in the book where he, when he sort of started taking over GE, what he found was a lot of people were having meetings and they were talking about all the good work they wanted to do. Key word was they wanted to do. Nobody was actually doing that good work, but boy, they were talking about it and they were having project meetings and they had flip charts and pie charts of, of stuff they wanted to do. And he, he was a very straight talker. He just said, look, I tell you what, we're going to get all the people in the room that need to fix this problem, and you all agree what you've got to do to fix the problem, and then bloody well go off and do it. And GE became, as you know, absolutely huge company, because he knew the difference between the knowing and the doing. He was very much about the doing. And the reason I mention this is because once you then start to find out, okay, what's in the business, what's driving the business, what's going to make it different, and so on and so forth, that's your knowing. The doing's got to be done, because if the doing isn't done, none of it will change. Does that make sense to people? Okay, cool. Well, I'm going to shut up, actually, you'll be, you'll be pleased to know. We've talked a little bit about this, um, the importance of understanding your business, how you can use metrics, sometimes well, sometimes badly, how sometimes the presenting problem, we've, we've got a useless induction, isn't actually the answer, how some of the solutions, ask the person the question, can be the easiest in the world. Um, whoops, so that's, that's pretty much me done. I've got a literally a few minutes.